They come for adventure, relaxation, and some fun in the sun. I didn't say whiskey. Whiskey. But what happens when the great vacation becomes the great escape? And it was like he was biting through butter. It just gone. He just got hit in the head, and he just went over the cliff, right in front of my face. Tonight on the Fifth Estate, the trouble with paradise. Three stories of holiday hell. Good evening, I'm Diana Swain. Every year, millions of Canadians pack their bags and head off on a holiday, hoping that careful planning, travel insurance, and a Canadian passport will help keep them safe. But all too often, they soon discover that once you're away from home, you're on your own in the event of accident, illness, or unexpected trouble abroad. Tonight, we'll bring you the story of a holiday that took its turn for the worse right here on this very beach. We'll also bring you stories of misadventure from high in the Andes. But we begin on the deck of a luxurious cruise ship. Here's Gillian Finley. I'm Bob McEwen. They call Machu Picchu the lost city of the Incas. Its name synonymous with South America's remote Andes mountains and the mystique of an ancient culture. If we had the seven wonders of adventure travel, it would probably be number one. But for two daring travelers from Western Canada, their trek to Machu Picchu would be less wonder than nightmare. Here's the cliff, and then you got your trail on the edge, and then there's just boulders coming down the side of the mountain. We heard him yell, run! And then when we turned around, he was gone. He just got hit in the head, and he just went over the cliff, right in front of my face. It's known as adventure travel, the growing segment of the tourism industry that attracts those who want to experience a foreign country, far from the niceties of hotels, restaurants, and tour buses. You could say there's risks involved in any travel, but there's certainly risks involved in adventure travel. Simon Vaughn writes for Outpost, the Canadian travel magazine for adventure seekers. Could be hiking to Everest Base Camp or going on safari or trekking for gorillas. So I think it has to be something that challenges you. And a challenge is something 24-year-old Nikita Haining of Edmonton rarely turns down. Nice. Nikita! We don't want to stay in five-star resorts or big hotel chains or anything like that. When it comes to adventure sports, she's been there, done that. We're scuba divers, so we did the Great White Shark dive in Australia. They put you in the cage and they lower you down and you get to swim with the great white sharks. It's a lot of fun. I want to experience every everything there is to experience. I don't want to miss out because I'm too scared to do it or anything like that. I just don't even think about it. Just do it. When they're not diving with sharks or from planes, Nikita and her boyfriend Daryl Buchanan have a siding business in Edmonton working together in spring, summer, and fall. But in winter, it's a different story. I'm up for anything. <laughs> anything that's crazy, you know, we usually go for it. Not too much after we say no. It's like carrots. So in January 2010, as usual, they headed south. This time to one of South America's foremost tourist destinations, Peru. Peru is best known for its archaeological sites. And none more so than Machu Picchu, the Inca's imperial city, built on a remote peak in the Andes 700 years ago, then abandoned, unknown to the outside world until the 20th century. It sits at the top of a mountain. It's not commercialized. It's pristine. It's as it was when the, the Inca left. The site itself is, is magnificent. It's, you know, it's one of the great wonders of the world. It was only rediscovered almost exactly 100 years ago. The first time you see the, any picture of it, it's, it's breathtaking. It's on the top of a mountain. It's just the most beautiful setting you could ever think of for any type of ruins or anything like that. And the age-old alpine path that leads to Machu Picchu is as treacherous as its setting is spectacular. 
almost 3,000 kilometers long. It once connected the Incan Empire. Today, the most traveled section is the final 42 kilometers, a four-day trek that ends at the legendary Lost City, the holy grail for hikers and backpackers. How difficult is that terrain for four days? It's all above 3,000 meters. Uh, it's tough. If you're of average fitness, it's really hard. It is, it's quite an endurance test. You're, you know, you've got passes that are over 3,500 meters. You've got very narrow ledges between canyons and cliff faces. You've got rickety ridges to cross. You've got very steep inclines. And then you have to think about the weather as well. You get it's cold at night. It can be raining, as, as we know. It's, uh, it's a tough haul. It's not to be taken lightly at all. And when tour operators sell the Inca Trail and Machu Picchu as a destination, is that all made clear, the, the sheer difficulty of it? With a good tour operator, it definitely is. With other ones, perhaps they downplay it a little. In the summer, in perfect conditions, even for the fit, the Inca Trail is a challenge. But Daryl and Nikita would be starting out in January, the rainy season. Add the altitude, and it's why they arrived in the Andes four days early, to get accustomed to their surroundings. On that final stretch of the Inca Trail, certified guides are mandatory. And they had got one of the most trusted on the mountain, who'd made the trek almost 300 times before, known simply as Washington. He was nice. He was really, like, soft-spoken and super knowledgeable. You could ask him about any plant or rock formations, names of the mountains, everything. He, he knew it all. But despite that, Daryl couldn't help worrying about the weather. I know we're going to be climbing a mountain, we're going to be hiking on the edge of the cliff, and it's going to be rain, and it's going to be, with rain, there's going to be mud. And I was thinking mostly about slipping in the mud. Nevertheless, Washington's group, including Nikita and Daryl, departed from Machu Picchu, four days and 42 kilometers ahead. Even in the wind and the rain, that stretch of the Inca Trail was busy, with several other groups also pushing towards the summit, including this party of about 20 from Argentina, mostly young women celebrating their graduation, among them 23-year-old Lucia Romalo. One girl was giving out chocolate bars to some people and that, and the other girl had some homemade candy she brought from Argentina and giving everybody a little piece. And there, you know, there, everybody was in a good mood, even though it was bad weather. People were still in a good mood and pretty chipper about it. What they didn't know then is that the government of Peru was about to declare a state of emergency because of the growing threat of floods below and of landslides above and conditions only worsened, not just torrential rain, but for some, altitude sickness and exhaustion. So when they reached their final campsite, it seemed the worst was over. After three exhausting days, Machu Picchu was now just one sleep and a few hours climb away. Hiking for like eight hours, we were just ready to lay down and go to sleep, have some food and go to sleep. And we came up and there's four tents all in a row and then the big kitchen, kitchen tent. And there's, I mean, literally like five inches from the tent to the edge of the cliff. The only thing I was thinking about is like in the middle of the night, if I have to get up, don't walk straight out the tent, you know, go to the left or go to the right. Just don't walk straight out. <laughs> nice come sight. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> That last night, there was a farewell ceremony like this one at dinner, yeah. with goodbyes from trekkers to their porters and the cook. Everybody, line up. <laughs> and envelopes with tips to say thanks for a safe trip. But after dinner that night, they would be told a state of emergency had indeed been declared. The signs of the deteriorating situation all around them. That night, Washington and the other guides met to decide the safest way off the mountain, continue on to Machu Picchu, or turn around 
and go back. And we're thinking, you know, we just hiked four days and he wants to turn back. And we're all, all kind of bummed out. We're thinking, I hope he says we're going to go, go for it, you know. Meanwhile, the young women from Argentina had finished their farewell beers, Lucia Ramalo among them, and climbed into the cliffside tents to sleep. Nikita and Darrow were about 30 feet away. Then, in the middle of the night, somewhere above, the pounding rain unleashed a landslide. Out of the darkness, rocks crashed onto the trail where the trekkers were sleeping, narrowly missing Nikita and Darrow, making a direct hit on one of the Argentine tents. It landed on top of the two girls. It, it killed the one girl and uh, crushed the other girl's arm. Lucia Romalo died instantly. This photograph, taken just hours earlier, was the last of her life. It was before dawn, still dark and pouring rain, and the question now was even more pressing. Go ahead or back? While the Argentine group and their guides came to grips with the tragedy, Daryl, Nikita, and the others just wanted to get on the trail as soon as possible to accomplish what they'd come for. Their guide, Washington, agreed. When they set out for Machu Picchu at 4.30, it was still dark and wet. It was raining hard, we were all getting soaking wet. You know, we, uh, we just kept hiking. We all had our heads down. They'd been trekking for an hour or so, midway to Machu Picchu, with Washington in the rear to make sure no one lagged behind. And then that's when the, the chaos all happened, the avalanche. Again, above them, the rocks gave way. Here's the cliff, and then you got your trail on the edge, and then there's just boulders coming down the side of the mountain. They did, from the rain, they had come loose, and they just came down. And when I looked up, there's boulders all over the place. Their guide, Washington, had time enough only to push the trekker in front of him out of the way and shout a single word. We heard him yell, run, run. And then when we turned around, he was gone. We all started just screaming out, like, Washington, Washington, you know, like, can you hear us? And ran back to the spot, and his backpack was laying on the cliff, and you could see his, it ripped his poncho off, and his jacket and hat were all laying in the bushes. You could see where he, right where he slid down, and Now, with rocks crashing around him, Daryl ran back through the landslide zone to their final campsite, where the women from Argentina were still in shock to warn them about the danger ahead. And they look at me and they go, what's going on? I said, well, my guy just went over the cliff, just got hit by a rock. And they were just like, oh, I can't believe it. Another person just died, you know? It was a matter of seconds, you know, if it... If I had stopped and tied my shoe, you know, it's, it could have been, could have been me, could have been Daryl, could have been, could have been any of us. Nikita Haining and Daryl Buchanan were marooned in the Andes for several days, along with thousands of others, before being evacuated by helicopter. Here we are, man. Though they say they will never forget what happened at Machu Picchu that day. They insist there's no one to blame for those terrible events on the Inca Trail. Well, it's changed me a little bit, that's for sure. You know, it's sad. It was a sad day up there. A lot of people lost their lives. It's a tragedy. But is it going to stop me from traveling or doing anything I'm going to do? No. I'm still going to do what I want to do, and that's travel and see the world.